Hello and welcome. My name is Joe O'Mara. I'm the Head of Aviation Finance with KPMG. And on behalf of KPMG and Airline Economics, I'm delighted to be joined by Austin Wiley, who is the CEO of Sky Leasing. Uh, Austin is joining us for the purpose of our leaders report, and I should say we're recording this on the 7th of November in Singapore. Austin, thanks again for joining us. Um, before we get into the meat of the conversation, do you want to tell our watchers, many of whom will know a little bit about Sky Leasing? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Joe. Um, Sky Leasing is a leading alternative asset manager. Uh, we have three and a half billion of, of aircraft, and we predominantly focus on new and next generation aircraft, originating those aircraft through the sale and leaseback channel. And, and maybe, Austin, do you want to maybe, as we say, take a look back over 2022 and tell us where have you found opportunities in the market and how have you seen kind of customer, customer performance evolve over the course of 22? Yeah, um, you know, I think what we've been impressed by is the resiliency of the passenger. In many ways, the customer is ahead of even our base case uh, in terms of demand for travel. And going into the year, we really felt there was going to be a continued shortage of aircraft. And we executed on that strategy by acquiring 12 737 MAXs opportunistically, realizing that airlines weren't going to be able to get their next generation aircraft fast enough from the OEMs and they would need that incremental lift to support what is a demand recovery that is proved to be quite resilient. And if you look at maybe the location of those customers, as I say, we're recording this in Asia, it's my first time being in Asia in three years. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the geographies you guys have operated in? I know we spoke last year, you had that LATAM opportunity that you pursued. Have you been focused on particular geographies? Um, I, I would say thematically, we continue to focus on large domestic markets countries that have abandoned test upon arrival that's clearly been to the detriment, detriment of passenger travel uh, and countries that have either consolidated or use covid uh, meaning the airlines use covid to fix long-term fundamental cost structure issues with their business model and so asia has lagged it's about 50 percent of pre-covid levels but we're starting to see the signs of recovery in the region uh, we're seeing travel pick up we've seen airlines successfully restructure their balance sheets, restructure their fleets. And so outside of India, we haven't invested uh, significantly in Asia, but we do expect that to change over the next six to 12 months. And maybe looking at the kind of macro environment, both from a geopolitical perspective and macroeconomic, um, we see lots of challenges and headwinds. So we have a very volatile interest rate environment. We have you know significant inflation across the globe challenges that we normally see around oil prices and airline infrastructure. When you look at that macro environment, what concerns you most from a lessor perspective and how challenging is it making kind of medium term planning for the business? Yeah, I think it's really the combination of rising dollar and rising ownership costs. And so we're paying a lot more attention to how airlines are passing on uh, those costs in the form of higher ticket prices. Do they have a diverse business model where they can get access to dollar revenues? Those are important mitigants. And, and within their cost structure, are they able to generate savings uh, from a depreciating currency, potentially, say, through labor? Um, and so those are really what we're focused on. Uh, from a geopolitical perspective, you know, unfortunately, we can't buy a derivative for geopolitical risk. Uh, and so all we can do is really manage that through diversification. Uh, that's been our, our biggest message to investors is diversification rules out in, in this industry where you don't know exactly what macro forces are going to cause a change in the cycle. But if you properly diversified your portfolio by asset type, by business model, by region, you're best insulated and protected uh, when that macro event hits. And is it causing you issues? I know I'm talking to some lessors on the insurance side. Is that just a cost that has to be bared for now? Is there anything to be done on that insurance market piece where, it, you know, where we're hearing you know, 10, 12 time multiples that people are having to face from an insurance perspective? Yeah, I think it's just a reality of cost of doing business. Uh, and so insurance will be higher for longer. Naturally, there will be some opportunistic insurers who will see that this is quite a profitable business to enter. And so it will normalize after a couple of years. There'll be more entrants that will come back in the business. We'll have a couple of years of, of time between what's happened in Russia uh, and the industry performing. So it's not of great concern to us. Um, we're just managing the cost as best we can today. And, and coming back to one of those macroeconomic points, which is around the interest rate environment. So 
we've seen a number of hikes we're continuing to see them um, and probably an expectation that we will see a couple of more hikes um, before the end of the year how challenging is that as a lessor and do you need the market to settle to allow kind of a trading environment to blossom again yeah i think um you know what's not what's the challenge is not necessarily the pace of the right of the rate rises it's people's views on how long we're going to be in an elevated interest rate environment and that's what's going to create the fundamental shift in people's expectations of the return they're willing to take uh, within aircraft leasing and so we've seen a fundamental shift from say q2 uh, when we were early in the rate rises to the fall here where people are starting to recognize that inflation's pretty sticky. We're going to be in this higher interest rate environment uh, probably for longer than people anticipated, uh, even in, in the summer period. And as a result of that, we're seeing people adjust their pricing, adjust their return expectations for that higher cost of borrowing. We think that's healthy in the end because uh, this business shouldn't be solely reliant on leverage to generate the returns. And so we're able to manage that uh, it does mean higher lease rate costs in the interim for, uh, for our airline customers. Um, but in the end, uh, this is a rate environment that we've been in before. Airlines are used to these types of challenges. And relative to COVID, it seems very manageable. And have you looked at kind of mitigants from a leasing perspective? So are you looking at rate linked or indices linked leases? Have you gone down that route yet? Or, or what are you thinking about it in that way? No, um, you know, we obviously try and manage that rate risk between signing up the deal and when it funds. Uh, so we have interest rate adjustment factors that we negotiate with the airline. But, you know, our institutional investors, they don't pay us to make bets on rates. Uh, they pay us to find attractive uh, risk adjusted returns in, in the aircraft leasing market. And so, um, you know, we do the best we can to manage that. Uh, I think we've proven out over time that even in higher interest rate environments, we can still generate attractive returns for this business. Uh, and it's really about how we message that to our investors. And on the liability side of the platforms that you're managing, what are you seeing on the debt side? So what opportunities are there? So we've probably seen, you know, I say when we spoke 12 months ago, we talked about some of the aviation banks, traditional ones retrenching a little. We'd seen the non-traditional non lenders probably enter the market. Um, and we might come to the capital markets in a moment. But on that lending side, excluding capital markets, what have you seen evolve over the last 12 months? Yeah, I think uh, more and more banks coming back for sure. Um, not just the investment banks, but regional banks, traditional, traditional transportation lenders. Um, you know, gone are the days of a match funded bilateral loan, 10, 12 year type uh, duration. Uh, we're seeing the banks want some velocity of capital. And so uh, for new aircraft strategies like Skies, you know, we see more demand for our product than, than frankly supply. Uh, and so you know, accessing capital at attractive rates is not a challenge. Uh, and we're locking in money that's typically five to seven years in duration. And on the capital market side, obviously you guys were you know, one of the first out of the bat in 21 with the extremely well-priced slam transaction. Um, we saw over the course of 21, eight, nine billion dollars of ABS, predominantly on the debt side, right? Maybe a bit of clubby equity. That market's very sentiment driven and is clearly shut for the moment. When you look at that channel, and it's one you played with in the past in Sky, is it one that you're still sizing up as, an, as a potential route to go down? And where, where and when do you think that market will go over the next year or so? Sure. Um, yeah, today it's not the most attractive option to finance the kind of aircraft that we're acquiring. Uh, and so we're just seeing much more attractive opportunities in the term loan market. Um, and we're actively exploring that uh, right now. And so, you know, from a capital markets perspective, you know, aircraft ABS is a small part of esoteric assets, which is a small part of fixed income uh, within asset backed securities. And so, there's a much larger ecosystem of investment opportunities for uh, these institutional investors. And right now they're seeing other opportunities that are offering a better risk reward opportunity. In general, the feedback that we get is benchmark rates need to normalize and then investors can actually understand the margin uh, that they're underwriting on a specific product. And so, you know, we have every confidence that the aircraft ABS market uh, will come back. Uh, but we also need to see that stabilization in rates to make that occur. And keeping with the capital markets, obviously not an area you guys play direct in, but we welcome your thoughts on it. We obviously saw you know, record issuances again in 21, 
you had the Aircap GCAS funding, which was a, you know, clearly exceptional, but you had every other IG rated lessor fill their boots very effectively. Um, your thoughts on when those IG rated lessors go back to the market? Maybe this speaks to aviation as an asset class that you were touching on then. Do you think when they do go back to the market, it'll just be a case of paying the premium where the market's moved? Or would you have any concerns that aviation might be looked at a little bit different in that unsecured market? I don't think so. I think these businesses are extremely robust. The diversification, uh, how these businesses have performed over many cycles now. You know, COVID was probably the worst imaginable event for our industry and all these leasing companies survived and continue to perform through that. And I think that carries more weight uh, with institutional investors than necessarily uh, what happened in Russia and any perceived risk there. And maybe bringing it closer to home then on, on the investor side, um, and to the extent you can talk to us, can you talk to us a little bit about the DAE transaction, which was announced recently, uh, which was a disposal of one of your funds. Can you talk to us a little bit about the rationale behind that transaction uh, and just where you see it going post-signing now? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, Sky's strategy is to originate large-scale diversified portfolios. We really believe the value creation is that portfolio construction uh, that we bring to, to our investor base. And with respect to Sky Fund One, we'd really achieved that. Uh, we were ending the investment period in that fund, and it was time to think about different harvest opportunities for uh, the fund. And we evaluated a number of different scenarios. And when we looked across the different uh, kind of macro events within the industry, we felt like there were lessors that wanted to accelerate their exposure to next generation technology beyond what they could otherwise do organically because the supply chain is still slow and recovering relative to the capital. Uh, and so we just saw a situation where there was frankly a shortage of next generation aircraft and investors would, would be willing to uh, pay a fair price for what we think is a great portfolio. And can you just, for our watchers, just outline what was involved in that portfolio and to the extent you can, tell us the levels of interest there, there were in it. Yeah, I mean, there was very significant demand across the board from all different types of, of leasing models. Um, and, you know, what we brought to the table was the SLAM transaction. So we had fixed rate debt. Uh, we had an attractive pipeline of aircraft that we're delivering and 85 percent next generation aircraft, which is just something you don't see in the secondary market. Uh, and so all of that led to a very unique situation where even players that don't historically play an m a wanted to take a look and participated in our process. I'd say that's the opportunistic disposal side. What have you then seen on the opportunistic investor side? Um, you guys obviously came in post COVID, uh, really when you started acquiring. So came in without the historical scars of, of the, the challenging uh, lessee environment that we'd seen. Um, you had your partnership with M&G. I believe you announced a partnership with, with Wafra uh, recently as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about the types of investors, one you've engaged with, or two, you know, have expressed in interest in engaging with you? Yeah, yeah, we're fortunate in this industry to attract a really wide cross-section of investors. Sovereign wealth funds, pensions, endowments, insurance capital, private equity, all of these guys participate in aircraft leasing in different ways. I think what's changed fundamentally this year is you had a lot of interest from credit funds, relative value players who were taking strategies that were largely liquid and because of the compression in rates, they were looking at more illiquid or less liquid strategies like aircraft leasing. We've seen those capital players retrench a little bit, invest in different opportunities as a result of the credit dislocation, but the long-term cash flow sovereign wealth funds, pensions, infrastructure, capital, endowments, they continue to value the stability of aircraft leasing and the long-term contractual cash flows that we can offer with that downside protection. And we talked previously about their desire to play in different elements of the capital stack, right? Have you seen that evolve over the last 12 months? And do you see a situation where maybe down the line, and maybe you're doing some of this already, that, that you are effectively facilitating senior debt type investments into aviation structures? I think that that is a great opportunity for uh, funds like ourselves, which is to unlock you know, the full capital solution for the airlines. And we have this discussion with airlines all the time, which is you shouldn't necessarily want 100% of your fleet on op lease. You shouldn't want 100% of your fleet on debt financing. 
you really want access to multiple financing products. That's what gives you the best optionality. And there are different risk adjusted returns that come with those different products. And so whereas lessors traditionally would have been focused on, you know, like ourselves, that, that really that equity piece, that sale lease back traditional operating lease. Today, we view it as our job is really to provide a capital solution to the airlines. And whether that's through finance lease, whether that's through PDP financing, whether that's through sale lease back, you know, those are really just different risk re return profiles. And it's our job to match up the, the product that the airline needs uh, with the investor base and the return profile that that investor is looking for. And, and looking at that with a Scully hat on, does that change the skill set? I mean, you, you guys have been around for so long with different iterations. Um, does it change the skill set of what you need internally? Or is it just effectively, look, I'm assessing risk in different ways, and this is a different level of risk that I'm now taking on? Or is there a skill set when you go down that path that's unique to what you've done before? No, I think it still requires at the end of the day, a deep understanding of the airlines. And we believe that the airlines are consensus decision makers at heart. And you know, you have to have developed that long-term relationship with the airline across the different departments, technical, finance, the executive team, the fleet management team. And only through those relationships and the longevity of those relationships can you get really insights into how they want to drive their fleet decisions. And so the financing and the numbers, you know, that is relatively mechanical. Uh, but how we help the airline understand and unlock the best solution for their fleet plan, that is really the skill that we're bringing to the table. And that fleet plan probably leads into my next question, really looking at the, the macro on leasing. So, you know, you go back to turn of the century, it was a quarter of the aircraft that are leased. You fast forward 22 years, we've breached the 50% threshold. And if you look at that long-term trend line, it only goes one way. Um, do you think post-COVID, given you know, the importance lessors were shown to have in the financing environment, that we will see a step change in that? We talked to some lessors, unsurprisingly, we talked to some lessors, they'll tell you 60% yeah, were on the way there. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts when you look at that kind of threshold piece? Is it, is it about right? Is it going to tick up or upwards? Where do you see that going? Yeah, I think it's a bit of a fool's errand to say that it's going to be a certain percentage number. Yeah. Um, really, who knows? And it goes back to, um, I think all airlines should utilize the lease product in some form or fashion as a part of their fleet. Uh, what their objectives are, their fleet strategy really dictate the percentage. Are they trying to keep an extremely young fleet where they want to return aircraft and have access to new aircraft? We see LCCs predominantly use that business model. And they have a very high proportion of their aircraft finance via sale leaseback as a result of that. On the inverse, we see network carriers with in-house MROs operating aircraft for a much longer period of time. And so naturally, they're going to want to own those aircraft, finance those aircraft in a different way because they're able to unlock that aircraft value in a, in a different way than maybe a low-cost carrier. And so you know, I, I really hate to generalize it. Um, certainly, I look at it as a continuation of the trend. but Eventually, I see it leveling off um, you know, at, at really where we are today. But the pie continues to grow, of course, because the dollar value of these assets increases and the number of units that the manufacturers are going to produce in the coming years is going to increase. And maybe keeping with the macro leasing theme, you know, we've seen a reasonable amount of consolidation post-COVID. Um, you know, so you take the aircraft transaction, which almost stands alone, but we've seen pretty large lessors, you know, being subject to M&A. We look at AMC, AMCK, we look at Goshawk, and they were in around that 150-odd aircraft piece, um, kind of taken into larger lessors. And post AirCap and post those transactions, what's your view on the importance of scale? And how do you think of scale as an asset manager rather than you know, a balance sheet lessor looking to be top six, top seven? Yeah, I think scale is important, but it has diminishing returns. Uh, and there's a minimum scale to transact with the airlines. You know, typically they want to transact in 200 to a billion, up to a billion in size, and you have to be able to deliver that. Uh, the asset management model really helps us do that because we can put those assets across multiple funds. We can offer investors co-invest. We can offer investors direct investments. And so we're able to manage that risk in a way that is probably exceeds what our you know, capabilities are as just a balance sheet player. Um, and so, you know, consolidation at the heart of it is really driven by the shareholders and their decisions they're making at the parent level 
about do they want to grow this business or do they want to redeploy uh, that capital into other businesses that they own. Uh, if there was one shift that I see happening at the moment today, it's that you know, sellers had the luxury of time with low interest rates uh, and they could wait for the opportune time to sell. Today, there's a much greater cost to waiting. Uh, and so what I think is going to play out over the next couple of uh, years is really is going to be there will be consolidation, but it'll be more driven by sellers needing to take action than necessarily buyers kind of preempting uh, a seller's decision, which is really what we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, brought buyers kind of proactively trying to, to stimulate M&A. Yeah, so, so maybe distress is overselling it, but, but that piece where you would say a seller's need might drive a little bit more from a transactional basis. Can I ask you on, on the new entrance side, your thoughts on what we might or might not see, right? So we're, we're sitting in Asia and where, where might that come from, right? So we've seen kind of a couple of U.S. private equity, uh, private equity backed, um, less lessors, but a bit more asset manager platforms, I would say. Uh, we're aware, obviously, you know, we've seen Saudi money enter the space very recently. Probably potential slight retrenchment of, of Chinese capital. Your thoughts on will we see new platforms emerge? And just if so, the geographies that might drive the equity in those platforms? Yeah, I think... It'll be very challenging right now for any new platform to grow significantly uh, quickly, right? given the supply chain challenges. And so if you want to grow quickly, you're going to have to do it in an inorganic way, meaning M&A. Uh, and that can be very challenging. You need a number of different factors to come together to have a successful M&A transaction. Uh, and so I think you know, anybody that's driven by size generally gets out of this business um, and so there's a long list of guys that you know, came in and said they wanted to be uh, top 10 or, or have that size as a goal, and they're no longer with us today. And so if you're going to survive in this business, it's because you're going and you're surviving through multiple different cycles, which means you're underwriting risk appropriately. You're not trying to grow beyond what the organic growth opportunities. And at the end of the day, this isn't a linear growth business. Uh, this is really a business where it's more episodic in terms of the growth. And I think when you study the successful platforms in this business, they're able to grow in between those events, but then there are certain times where they're really able to take advantage of the market and substantially expand their portfolios. Uh, and those are the types of, of platforms that have that long-term successful track record. And maybe shifting gear a little bit, um on the topic of ESG with a particular focus on E, um, you have a great fleet from an ESG perspective, right? With, with the, 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 new, the new technology focus that you've had, but just how big a factor does it play into for you now when you're both speaking to investors, either on the equity or the debt side, how probing are they are for you know, an asset manager lessor like yourself as to what you're doing and what you're proactively going to do over the coming years? Sure. Um, you know, we're careful to say we are not an ESG investment strategy. It's not a part of our formal criteria for evaluating an investment return. Uh, but naturally, you know, we want to participate with airlines that take their role as being a good corporate citizen seriously. Uh, and so we're happy to work with those teams that have airlines that have existing ESG initiatives and see how we can use that to create maybe a better financing opportunity for them or an opportunity to help them meet their KPIs at the corporate level, but it doesn't drive our investment decision making today. Um, from an investor standpoint, you know, investors ask about it. There are sensitivities to investing in carbon emitting uh, industries like aviation, but investors are also pragmatic. They understand that it's going to take multiple decades for us to transition from fossil fuel to alternative sources. And so on the whole, I think ESG is a positive for our business. It's gonna require a significant amount of private and public capital to help facilitate this transition. And there's gonna be a lot of investment opportunities as a result of that. And maybe to pick up on a concern before moving back to an opportunity point, would you in the near term, it doesn't sound it right, but be worried that the pool of investors that you can pitch at might shrink a bit, as you say. I mean, aviation will never be green. Um, I mean, despite what some people might talk about green bonds, they don't exist, right? When you fundamentally understand what they are, do you think that that pool might contract a bit and all that just then feeds into the cost of funding that you might have to face? We don't see it materially impacting it. 
and on the opportunity side just talk to me more about that and what they might be right one area that we see everyone chat around is SAF right it seems you know you look at what I had put out it is the key building block to reducing emissions do you think the leasing community can play a more active role in the development and use of SAF I think it can. Um, I think it's more challenging for traditional lessors to play in that versus uh, alternative asset managers like Sky because we're really talking about different types of capital that are needed. It's predominantly project finance at the end of the day where the airlines have committed to X percentage is going to be SAF and the question is how are they going to get the supply to meet that demand. And that's going to require a tremendous amount of project finance, a tremendous amount of debt financing to help these SAF producers scale to meet the needs of the airlines. Uh, you're also gonna need venture capital, right? Uh, and so, you know, on the whole, this is bringing even more different types of capital to the space uh, than what we've traditionally seen uh, coming into the space. And so it's a positive. I do get concerned that SAF, maybe the rhetoric is ahead of the reality uh, and that people aren't putting enough attention into the infrastructure piece and also other technologies long term that we have to be investing in today if we're really going to get to a carbon neutral industry. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, as you say, you've got such a capital outlay, such a government buy in, right, that's probably needed on the SAF side. And you just wonder the surely crossover when you look at the financiers on the leasing side that know the space and, and what might happen. I think it'll be an interesting one we'll definitely be coming back to in the coming years. Um, in relation to fleet focus, it's maybe an easier question for Sky. You guys have predominantly focused um, on narrow body new tech. Um, when we spoke last year, you mentioned the fact that well, that, that ability to access narrow body new tech is tightening, right? We'll come to the OEMs in a moment. Are you widening your fleet focused on investable metal? Are there other assets out there that you kind of say, yeah, I could see us playing in that, if, you know, if the price and the customer base was right? Yeah, I mean, I would say on the margin, we're looking at A220s. Uh, we've done uh, some turbo props before in the past, uh, but really this is, you know, kind of on the margin type product for us. At the end of the day, there's plenty for us to do in our core asset types, the MAX, the NEO, the 787, A350. Uh, and we've been able to find those origination opportunities, like opportunistically acquiring the, the MAX aircraft, which were, did not have lease attached uh, when we acquired them, and now we're placing them on lease uh, with customers around the globe. And from a pricing perspective, we, we talked the interest rate environment, the logical piece is that should push lease rate factors. We've known historically there's always been a lag, but are you seeing that uptick in pricing follow through as it naturally should? On lease rates? Yes. Yeah, we are seeing lease rates go up. Um, you know, it's not a perfect dollar for dollar hedge against rising rates, but that's not entirely unexpected, right? Because airlines are committing to that fixed rental for eight, 10, 12 years time, and we will have the opportunity to refinance our balance sheets several times in between that lease. And so, you know, I think that it's generally healthy, it's continuing to go up. Of course, you know, selfishly, LSOR, we would always like higher lease rates. Uh, but we feel like there's a great balance now uh, in terms of where lease rates are going and the supply demand dynamic for aircraft. And then the crowd of that is, I suppose, around asset values, right? You've been through a sales process very recently. Your, your perception on asset values, you know, very heightened interest, uh, inflationary environment, which again, hasn't always directly correlated with what we've seen in aircraft values. Your thoughts on where values are going in the near term? Yeah, we see values firming up across the board. Uh, I think uh, a year ago we said, you know, the NEO is the gold standard, particularly the 321 NEO, but you know, the MAX is presenting like a great alpha opportunity and we continue to see a good rally in, in 737 MAX values. Um, we're seeing firming of midlife values too. Um, new aircraft become more expensive, the nominal lease rate is becoming higher. Naturally, that's gonna force some of the airlines that thought they could have MAX and NEO as a part of their business plan realize they need to continue to operate midlife aircraft. And I think investors probably over, are overly optimistic on how quickly we can transition to new technology aircraft. And so you know, midlife aircraft still on the narrow body side represent an attractive investment because they're going to be operated for a significant amount of time. And so you know, I think it's not healthy for the industry to necessarily have eight, nine percent annual inflation uh, but we can certainly survive uh, with price increases, you know, in the three, four, five percent range uh, for an extended period of time. 
And a lot of that feeds back into maybe the OEMs and production rates. And you mentioned a couple of times you're chatting to the backlog that's there and the challenges they face. How concerned do those backlogs or planned productions rate make you or your thoughts generally about planned OEM output? We're very bullish on the demand from the airlines. I think it's a bit different from a lessor like Sky focused on sale leaseback where, you know, we're not as sensitive to growth at the end of the day. The airlines need these aircraft, whether it's for growth or replacement. And so if we go into a recession next year and demand declines, airlines are still going to take maxes and neos because they want to improve their cost structure. So they're just going to increase the percentage of aircraft that they use for replacement versus growth. And so you know, we're in the camp that the manufacturers are justified for increasing production uh, and that the challenge really is message management and being realistic, of course, which is it's nice to increase production, but it needs to be done appropriately and it needs to be done in a way where the airlines can manage their fleet such that they're not expecting you know, five aircraft for a high season and all of a sudden they only get two, uh, which is very problematic for airlines running their business. And, and just in closing, Austin, as you look out into 2023, lots of opportunities we talked about there, but lots of uncertainties. What are your optimism levels like? I'm extremely optimistic from an investing standpoint because we're increasing, we're seeing an increasing supply of new aircraft from the OEMs. There's a very clear demand from the airlines. You have now long haul travel, business travel that's come back in a, in a major way. And all of that is stimulating a lot of demand for capital. Uh, and so I think it's going to be a fantastic opportunity uh, for investors like Sky to help airlines transform their fleet over the next 12 to 24 months, despite all of the uncertainty that we see in the marketplace. Austin, as always, I'd like to thank you for your insights and wish you and Sky Leasing a very successful 2023. Thanks, Joe.